Okay, it's live, Matthew, I think. <laughs> All right, good deal. All right. um, <clears throat> going to... I'm just going, going to cable layer now. So... Shangdong, is that it? Shangdong? Yes. Okay, good deal. How's, how's your day? So far, so good. I taught a three day class Monday through Wednesday, so uh, I, I didn't have anything to teach today, so that was good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's some other work I got done. Yeah. You're over in Mobile, is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I'm just a little north of Pascagoula. Oh, okay. It's not a, very far from here. Yeah, not at all. Hopefully, I mean, we have um, a little bit more than 100 people register. Um, so I don't expect that every single res uh, register are going to be yeah, here. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> not <but> usually. <laughs> <laughs> if we get two thirds, that'll be good. Yeah, well, um, we'll see. I, I can't, I don't expect that we could even get a half. Though, but, yeah, yeah, probably not. Yeah. Okay. That'll still be good. So yeah. be a nice group. Yeah. I was uh, wasn't expected to get so many um, RSVP. Um, well, I saw you, it pop you know. up on LinkedIn from I guess somebody at the Docker org, you know, and uh, so that must be. Uh... <laughs> no, well, you know, every time I post the meetup is through Docker and through the meetup both places. Yep. Not really get a whole lot of people. I mean, at least locally, but mm -hmm. this time, for some reason. <laughs> it's the link is attract a lot, whole lot of the people, I guess. Well, that's good. I guess maybe the topic you're going to present is more interesting than typical talk. <laughs> uh, well, I think it's just hot in the Docker world right now, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, what do you do over in Mobile? Um, I work for uh, the SSA group. As I'm doing the as a developer over there. Gotcha. What do you mostly code in? C sharp. Uh, ah, yeah. yeah. I've been doing C sharp for a long time. Java. I'm just trying to learn Go now. Uh, you know, I got some stuff. Go is what I guess Docker's written in, but uh, so I'm trying yeah, to learn Go yeah. now. But uh, yeah, same. I've done a lot of C sharp work through the years. Yeah, same here. I'm trying to learn Go as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My little one just pop out here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come check in, see what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, we have Venkata and VP and Mike. Welcome to you guys. Let's see, uh, we'll get going here. We'll get a few more minutes. Yep.
I hope for maybe uh, <coughs> approaching the the fall or at the end of the year, as everything open up, maybe we will do do the in person. Yeah, yeah. Well, we hope so. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah, I guess uh, it's looking promising as I see people getting the uh, vaccine shot and be a little bit more careful. I yeah. should be able to get a small amount, maybe. Small yeah, group of people so. get together. Mm -hmm. Well, here in Mississippi, I guess they're just opening it up to kind of the general public. So uh, that's good. I'll get the vaccine when I can get it scheduled and make it all work. But uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, hopefully, it's, we can pass it. I mean, uh, yeah. Pretty much. It's, can find a, a house for a year. <laughs> yeah. I used to travel. I've spent most of my career traveling like, you know, 30, 40 weeks a year. And uh, mm. I've been I've been home more in the last 12 months than in the last 25 years, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> that's not necessarily bad. That's not necessarily <laughs> bad. But uh, it's definitely been a change for me and my family. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Luckily, I had a, a daughter that has moved off on her own now, so her her bedroom became my office. <laughs> okay, yeah. let's work it out, man. <laughs> yeah, that's it. There it works. Jessica, welcome to you. We're gonna, we've got a few more minutes here. We'll get going. Yeah, I probably give a little bit more minutes. That people get in. Uh, mm -hmm. Look like I have to admit people. They are. Unfortunately, yes, you're going to have yeah. to admit them all. Yeah. I think since you created it, uh, I think only you'll have the power to uh, let them in. I don't think it'll yeah. let me do that. So, yes, you're going to be doing the what admit all button a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope. I mean, yeah. Hopefully, I can do that all along. That means we get a lot of people drawing on us. Yeah. So how long are you uh, teaching the Kubernetes? So. Um, maybe two and a half years. I guess Kubernetes okay. came out in twenty fourteen, I think, and uh, uh, I. I got a job working for Google teaching classes about two and a half years ago. Oh, okay. And uh, it was one of the first things I started teaching. So I, I do a lot of Kubernetes, Anthos, Istio, a lot of things around Kubernetes uh, as part of the training. But it's all, you know, in, in context of Google Cloud is all the stuff I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. It's pretty good. It's, it's been interesting to watch it. It's it's obviously the same thing with Docker, right? Docker really ex has exploded because it's what Docker came out in 2013, I guess. So, uh, um, is that right? 2020, this, is, this year, um, in actually, this Wednesday, uh, May 15th, uh, it's the eighth uh, year so old. Yeah, and see, Kubernetes is a little over five, so. Yeah, but the Kubernetes take the way. I mean. Oh, yeah, it's it's kind of amazing how Kubernetes went from nothing to tremendously huge overnight. Yeah. Yeah. That stat I had in my write up, I thought was interesting that it's like, you know, got like 80% of the market now or something for running containers. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Okay, six. Let's give uh, two more minutes to see how many people are going to jump into the call. Um, uh -huh. And well, I'm going to um, just uh, say a few words about how we're going to go along with this format. And then I'm going to hand over it all, hand it, uh, to, over to you. All right, perfect. Welcome to you, Terry, there. I saw it looked like you were about to say something. but <laughs> Oh, I just wanted to say, hey, Zhang Dong. Hey, Terry. Good to see you. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. We moved back to Raleigh. So hello from Eastern time zone. 
Yeah, well, is that layer still really cold? I mean... Uh, we have some thunderstorms coming in soon. It's it's oh, warm. Wow. So I I have a UPS backup. I I don't think I'll lose power though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Raleigh Durham Research Triangle. Okay, so looks like the people are coming in. All right. Welcome, guys. We're going to wait a couple more minutes here. We'll get started. about where you guys are today, but uh, in southern Mississippi, it's uh, we have cooler weather for us, but that means, you know, 60s <laughs> for this time of year. <laughs> I won't rub it in depending on where you're coming from. Can always be hotter, can always be cooler, right? Yeah, for sure. Well, you guys got these storms um, yesterday or two days ago. How were they? Well, here in Mobile, it doesn't really have a big storm. I think last night we probably have the thunder, uh, lightning, and yeah. pretty tight band came really through big. and it dumped, you know, like half an inch in like no time. You know how it is. And uh, but then it moved on out, and and luckily we didn't have any problems with tornadoes or anything. There were a lot of warnings and stuff. All right. All right. Uh, I think uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Join us um, for this uh, mobile Alabama Docker meetup. Um, so um, and before we get started, introduce our speaker and the topic, uh, get some um, housekeeping thing uh, squared away. Um, so uh, please uh, mute yourself uh, during the presentation, and if you have any question, put it in the chat window. So we're going to, um, whenever uh, when the presentation presentation is over, we're going to uh, go over the questions um, by then. So, um, so welcome. Uh, today we're going to uh, talk about the uh, containers. Uh, we uh, we have our speaker here, uh, Pat Patrick. Um, yes, yes. And uh, he, I'm gonna read uh, his bio here. He's <laughs> <As> a <laughs> cloud uh, consultant and the trainer for with extensive experience in the cloud technologies and cloud mag uh, migration, Kubernetes, and whole bunch of things <laughs> uh, you can find me on linkedin if you want yeah <laughs> yeah you work, working in this field from like since 90s that's 30 years right in development yeah yep. right yep. writing code and stuff a long time yeah yeah 
So, um, without further ado, I'm going to hand that over to um, Patrick. Um, here. All right. Good deal. Welcome, guys. Yeah, uh, I'm actually right near Mobile, Alabama. I live in southern Mississippi, so I'm Mobile's right over here, so I'm right over there at the edge. Uh, I used to travel all the time and do consulting and training uh, travel, but with COVID, of course, that stopped. And so now I'm set up and I do most of my training from home. Um, my background is definitely software development. Uh, I've spent most of my career as a programmer. Uh, maybe five, six years ago, I started trying to push my clients towards development in the cloud. Uh, you know, build that service, build that app in the cloud. And, and they, you know, start asking me how you do that. And uh, I've done some AWS, I've done a, a fair amount of Azure, but the cloud where I worked the most and, and still do most of the work is Google. So I got a job as a consultant working with Google, uh, teaching classes on using Google Cloud. And one of the areas where I do a lot of training is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is completely open source. You know, I always joke when I teach a class on Google Kubernetes that, you know, it's probably 85 percent standard. And then there's the 15 percent of how does it work in this cloud or that cloud or the other. But anyway, information about me, you can see right here. Uh, I got this presentation in Dropbox. If you want a copy, you can either drag, grab, grab a copy now or if you prefer, if you wait till uh, if you wait till I'm done, I'll save all my annotations. I'm going to do some annotations as I teach, and I'll save my annotations in there. But I'll put this in the chat window. There's a Dropbox link to this presentation that I'm going through. Like I said, you can grab a copy now if you want. You can grab a copy later on if you want to wait till I have all my annotations in there. Anyway. Um, I didn't interrupt a little bit. Um, as far as the link goes, so at the end of the meeting, I'm going to send out the uh, email. I'm going to include the link. And this uh, right. um, meetup is going to be recorded. Uh, I'm going to put it uh, put up into YouTube. I'm going to have the link for that as well. Perfect. All right. So if you're, you know, if I just do a crash course of the Docker story, right, you know, a lot of us started on bare metal machines. And, you know, the nice thing about bare metal machines, of course, is when you're writing an app, you can take full advantage of whatever hardware you're running on. But there's all kinds of problems with things like recovering from a backup or, you know, running multiple server side apps all in one machine is really advisable. So now you start buying lots of small servers to run different apps. And, and then, of course, virtualization isn't a new technology. Uh, IBM invented virtual machines in like the 1960s for IBM mainframe stuff. But really, VMware popularized the virtual machine, right? And when you, you know, have something like VMware or KVM or whatever, you know, what you basically do is you kind of have faux hardware and you, your hypervisor. And so your virtual machine, you know, it has an operating system. And when that operating system sees a network card, it like sees that fake network card on the hypervisor. And the fake network card just translates to, you know, the real network card. So now you're at like ESXi technologies like that. The problem, though, with doing things that way, you, you, you get easy scalability, but it's at the virtual machine level. I want to write a new application. Uh, I'm going to write it in C Sharp. Uh, so I'm going to spin up a Windows Server environment. Well, now if I have two like, you know, C Sharp applications and I got two different Windows Server environments, you know, Windows Server is not what I would call a lightweight operating system, right? So um, duplicating the entire stack from the hardware up, you know, there, there's a lot of nice things about that. It's very self-contained, but there's a lot of overhead that brings. So, you know, along comes Docker. There's lots of, you know, in the early days, in the early 2010s, if you will, lots of technologies came out to try to do containers, you know. Yeah, uh, but Docker really kind of won that war. And Docker came along with this idea that said, well, you know, let's build a container. Uh, yeah, not lightweight, that's for sure. Um, let's build a container. And in that container, you know, let's put our application. And um, here they say bin and libraries, right? <coughs> uh, what I would generally say is dependencies. You know? So I've got, I got my dependencies in there. And, uh, you know, so I'm picking up whatever dependencies it takes. What kind of container are you building? You know, you put your dependencies in there. 
And now if I have two different C sharp applications, or I got two C sharp applications and you know a, a Java application and a Node application, it doesn't really matter because what I do is I move my line of virtualization from kind of the hardware to where it's really above the operating system. So you know in my Windows story, I could have like one locked down version of say Windows Server, and you know I could have multiple containers running on top of that. Or, you know, most, a lot of containers are more Linuxy kind of containers. You know, I can have all these different containers running all these technologies and it's self-contained. If I have two different Java applications, you know, the inefficiency would be, I have two complete copies of kind of that Java library stack, if you will. But still, even though that eats up some extra space, containers tend to be very small. They tend to be very fast starting. And also, let's face it. Um, I don't know how many times as a developer, you know, I've been on the phone and said the words, oh, that doesn't work in production. That's strange. It works perfectly fine in my dev environment, right? And, and you know, nine times out of 10, that's because there's some dependency that varies, a library or whatever. So honestly, these days, it's worth having that extra copy um, so I can avoid that, that problem. They call that, you know, the parity problem between dev and prod, and it really helps address that, right? So I come along with Docker. Okay, so I got a links file I created and you can find my links file over here. I just mapped a little URL to it. Um, let me put it in the chat window. I created this links file and my links file I created, it's mostly Google Cloud links that I created this for, but in my links file, I have a whole subsection on Kubernetes. And like I said, most of my Kubernetes subsection is you know uh let me give you that so there's uh if you want the ugly long url there's the ugly long url that should take you right to the kubernetes section right so i have a kubernetes section in here where i have a whole bunch of topics and you'll see in my presentation i got some links that i've dropped in my presentation they all come out of here right um now you know for kubernetes i wrote it at kind of the bottom of my kubernetes 101 section I wrote a little hello world application over here. So let me grab my URL to my Git repo and I'm gonna come over here in Google Cloud. Uh, I got a test project in Google Cloud. Google Cloud has this thing called a, a, a cloud shell. It's just a little mini virtual machine in the cloud. And I'm gonna use that to kind of as a jumping point for a couple of demos I'm gonna do. So let me spin up cloud shell. Let me open it in its own tab. So I'm basically SSH into this little virtual machine here in Google Cloud. Let me clone down my sample application here. Uh, and let me open up, this little editor has a, uh, Cloud Chill also has a little editor in it. You see that editor is basically Visual Studio Code there. Anyway, it's got a little editor here. So I, I wrote a really basic Hello World JavaScript application. There's my Hello World JavaScript application. Give me a second. Font size. Here. Okay. Okay, so here's a really basic JavaScript application. It's using a standalone lightweight Node.js web server express. Um, down here, it checks the environment for a port. If it doesn't find one, it just defaults to port 80 and it listens on port 80. And I got one route, which is the Hello World route. You go to its home page, it prints out Hello World, right? Little JavaScript application. Okay, so what I write in Docker, right, is I write a file that's a Docker recipe. Your first line is your base. Go to Docker Hub and go find the Node 12 image. When you build a container, right, you start with kind of as light a weight a container as you can get, right? So I'm gonna build a node container. It just has what I need in there for node. If you go to my links file in my Kubernetes section, I have the section on containers, and you know, I got a link to Docker Hub right there. That's right where that image would download. So it's gonna, it would pull down that image, you know, then in the image, set the working directory to the app folder. So this is, I'm describing my container. In my container, there's gonna be a user source app folder. Copy the package JSON file into user source app. Working directory like changes into that folder. Um, package JSON is a dependency file in JavaScript. My dependency file says, well, yeah, this code depends on the express library and it might have some secondary dependencies, right? And by the way, you know, here's the entry point for this application. So I got that stuff in there. 
Um, then I run an NPM install command that loads the dependencies into the container, right? Remember what I'm doing is I'm describing one of these containers here. These containers all come from what's called an image, which is just a binary file, right? It's a binary file using that, what is it? The uh, uh, container runtime interface, CRI, you know, OCI. There's a, there's a standard format for that binary image. And I'm just describing that, what's gonna go in my binary file. Go into that image and run NPM install. That's a Node.js thing that basically says, load all those dependencies. Then I essentially say, copy in the rest of my application. I got a Docker ignore file that says, ignore these files. Don't copy those files in, but copy the rest of the stuff into my image. And you know that's kind of that central section. I got my from, build the foundation, then what does it take to kind of load the application into the image? And the last line in Docker files is basically, how do you run this, right? You run NPM start. You run NPM start, it comes in and it says, oh wait, NPM start? What's NPM start mean? NPM starts means run that index file. Okay, so I've described my image, right? I've described it. Now, if I wanna run this image, you know, what I could do in like classic Docker is I could come along and do like a Docker build command, and then that build command would build that image, and then I could take that image and push it to some kind of registry. Now, since I'm doing a googly example here, I, I wrote a little script for myself so I could do this easily. Um, Google has a command that wakes up this Google product called Cloud Build. Cloud Build's a lot like Jenkins. And it essentially says, hey, hey, Cloud Build, you know, build this image. And Cloud Build looks in the current folder and says, is there a build description file? Like a Jenkins build file kind of? No, there isn't. Okay, is there a Docker build file? Yeah, there is. Okay, so it's gonna build and push is what it's gonna do. So if I come out here and say, uh, let me change into my folder and let me run my little build script here. Uh, let me run my little build script. It asks me for a version number. I'm just gonna go with 1.0, that's fine. And what it's gonna do is, again, if you watch, if you've ever done a Docker build, it's, it's basically doing a Docker build command, right? So it goes out there and it says, oh, okay, you know, you want to build this image. Well, I got a series of steps in this Docker file. And the first one really says, go out there and get the Node.js 12 image. So you see it's building that Node.js 12 image. It's pulling that down. So you'll see in this pop-up, it'll say like step one of six, step two of six, step three of six. So it's just, so it's doing step one right now, which is that one. You know, then you're gonna see it's gonna zoom to like that one right there where it does a build. Yeah, so set the working directory, yeah, right there, npm install. So now it's setting up all the stuff, right? Now my script at the end of this, the way this cloud build command works, this says, go to Google Cloud. And in Google Cloud, there's a Docker registry in my current project. And go to that Docker registry in my current project. And I want you to push that image to a hello world demo folder, and I want you to tag that end with the image number. See, it popped out my URL right there. That's the URL to my Docker image. And if I go to Google Cloud, if I go to Google Cloud, like I said, in Google Cloud, it has a Docker registry, this container registry thing. Again, Docker registries are open source. You don't have to use, this is, this is, there's nothing proprietary Google about anything I've done. You know, this is just a Docker registry you see right there. And there you see my tag with that 1.0. Okay, so, you know, I built an image. So I'm this far, right, over here. Now I need something that can run that image. Well, you know, the classic way of running that image is you're going to run it with Docker. You know, I'm on my Mac here. You know, I'm on my Mac and I've got the, you know, Docker downloaded and installed on my Mac. I could absolutely run it on my Mac, right? That, that's fine. To back up a little step here, what really runs your Docker image is, this is your image down here. You know, they have this uh, container runtime interface on your image, and, or uh, container runtime interface on container D. Container D is the container daemon that like runs the Docker container, right? And that's my image right there, right? What is it, OCI, Open Container Initiative or something? That format, that's my image. That's a open container initiative. That's what it, your actual built image, that's the standard it conforms to. So that's my image down there. 
So my image is out there. And in order to run that, what I really need to run an image is Containerd. I don't technically need Kubernetes or Docker. I really need Containerd to run the image. If you're running in Docker, what Docker does is Docker takes that Containerd and it kind of goes this path, right? You know, so it, it takes that image and it, it, it runs it through container D on the container image. And then Docker gives you some nice user interface capabilities, you know, because it's got this nice app here I'm running on my, on my uh, Mac, right? So that's kind of the path that Docker takes. But that's not only the way, that, that's not the only way you can run containers, right? Container D, the container daemon is what really runs the image. And container D, actually has this container runtime interface here that you can use to run container D images. So another way, or OCI images, another way you could run this is, I don't actually have to run it through Docker. I could actually have something else out there that could run it. And if I'm in Kubernetes, the Kubernetes path is kind of right here. Kubelet is a component in Kubernetes. I'm about to show you here when I talk about Kubernetes, right? So Kubelet is a component in Kubernetes. They just announced Kubernetes is drop it, dropping Docker support and everybody like in the Kubernetes world freaked out. And they're not really, all they're really changing is, you know, Kubernetes used to basically take the same path here where Kubernetes would go through something called a Docker shim to run it kind of the Dockery way. Um, all they're really doing is they're getting rid of that Docker shim and they're gonna run it this, uh, OCI container runtime image interface, you know? So this container runtime interface is like a generic way of running container D. So when they say they're do dropping Docker support, they're, they're just, it's still a Docker image because it's still that OCI image. I'm gonna still write my Docker files. I'm gonna still do all my dev work the same way. But technically in the running of an image in, in uh, Kubernetes, there's not gonna be a Docker layer. It's just gonna go from container D through that, CRI to the kubelet to the rest of container to the rest of Kubernetes, right? Anyway, so Kubernetes, what is Kubernetes? Um, Docker does a really good job of this kind of thing. I can build an image, you know, I can run the image, and if I'm doing that on my dev machine or if I'm doing it here, you know, I could run that Docker image right there in that little that little virtual machine in the cloud. It's really good at that kind of thing. The problem is. What about when you have 300 or 400 or thousands of images, right? If you've got thousands of containers that have to run, you know, like let's say I want to build a web, my web application. I don't want to have just one copy of my web application running because if I have one copy, I got a single point of failure. And also I'm only going to be able to handle so much load. So I might want to create multiple copies of my one application and maybe spread it over a cluster of machines. A cluster is basically, if you will, a group of VMs. You know, that's basically what a cluster means, um, a group of VMs. If I wanted to build that cluster right there, well, go to my links file, uh, and I've got a whole section on creating a cluster in my links file. And, you know, you want to run it on your dev machine? Get Minigube. It's really easy. This little, you know. You want to install it on prem with COPS or something, you know. Uh, go the Kubernetes has a whole web page. You want to set it up in Alibaba or AWS? You know, this is where the cloud also comes in. Every cloud out there can do a kind of hosted version of Kubernetes. Okay? Since I'm doing a demo that's based in Google's cloud, I'm going to come over here to Google's Kubernetes engine. It's one of Google's compute technologies, and I'm going to come in and say, "Hey, Google, I want to build a cluster, okay? standard cluster, yeah." I want to build a cluster here and it's going to ask me specs, right? It's like ordering off a menu. Uh, what do I want to call it? How about cluster demo? That's good. Where do you want it to run? It's got to run in a Google data center somewhere. I got to say that. What version of Kubernetes do you want? And would you like Google to auto upgrade your Kubernetes version for you? Yeah, that sounds good to me, right? How many machines do you want in your pool? Okay. What I'm describing here is this. What you're really looking at in this picture is four machines. Right, my cluster picture here is really four machines. Yeah, absolutely, Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I, I, got a, uh, I got a buddy that's running Kubernetes in Raspberry Pi. I mean, you can set it up all kinds of places, right? Um, so what I'm, this picture right here actually has four machines. Node, 
the term node in the Kubernetes world just means a machine or if VM, if you prefer. Um, so I, I'm showing you four machines here. I've got these three nodes over here. These are my workers. They're actually hosting my running workload. And then over here, I've got what they call a master node, right? The master node represents my control plane. It's kind of my management tier. So if I wanted to build this cluster in Google Cloud, in Google, they don't show you that master node. It's like off screen somewhere in Google Cloud. I, you know, what you do see though, is you see your worker nodes. And that's what I'm specifying right there. How many machines am I gonna have? Well, I wanna match that picture, so I have three. And again, you know, you're gonna make decisions like, how big are these machines? Okay, well, I'm gonna do E2 standard machines. Each of my machines is gonna have four CPUs and 16 gigs of RAM. Again, either because it's physical machines or it's VM machines and VMware or what else, what else, whatever, right? Drive side, you know, your clouds also give you lots of extra options. Would you like, you know, machine learning processing? Would you like to load Istio into your cluster? You know, there's a whole menu of choices if you're in like a cloud provider. Now, I'm not gonna get into any of that. So I'm just gonna create my cluster and it'll take it a couple of minutes to build this cluster. When it comes up, it'll look like that. The control plane has basically this thing called a Kube API service. That's a REST service right there. And that REST service, the Kube API server, server, that's where all your config commands will go. Okay, in a minute, I'm gonna introduce the idea of kubectl. Kubectl is a little command line management tool for Kubernetes. It talks to that REST service here, that API service. There's etcd. That's a little bitty database. Where are all your configurations stored when you load them into your cluster? They're there. Okay. There's a kube scheduler, right? The kube scheduler looks at your cluster and says, How, what, what available resources are out there? So every time you deploy a container into your cluster, it's really the scheduler that's deciding where should this container go in this cluster of machines out here? Because I got one to many machines, right? Where it can possibly run. Um, and you can, you can get fancy, right? You could have you could have hundreds or thousands of machines in your cluster if you really wanted to. Uh, I could have some machines that were for Windows work Windows containers and some machines for Linux containers or whatever. It's all up to how you put your cluster together, and it's the scheduler that decides where a new container goes. Right? You have your controller manager. Your controller manager mainly is looking at the configurations you've given the cluster and checking that what's actually happening. You said there should be three copies running. Are there three copies running? If there's not three copies running, we have a problem. We need to start a, a, a third copy, right? So this, the controller manager is trying to make sure the specified state in the cluster always matches the current state in the cluster, right? And then you got this thing they call the cloud manager. The cloud jet manager just connects to where are you running this? Are you running in Google Cloud? Are you running this in AWS? Are you running this in Azure, you know? but you run it in VMware, the cloud manager just coordinates operations with the cloud where it's running. Certain things you do in your cluster might cause the cloud to do extra things for you. Like one of the things I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna create something called a load balancer service. And the way Google Cloud is gonna react is it's actually gonna spin up a Google Cloud load balancer and put it in front of my cluster for me, right? It's really the cloud manager that does that. So your control plane is really composed of these master nodes, which are just trying to coordinate and manage the cluster. The kubelet is on the worker nodes. The worker nodes are where your workloads actually run. And like I said, the kubelet is right there. So really the thing that's gonna run my container is still container D just like in Docker, but it's really gonna go through this, this standard container runtime interface through the kubelet. And you know, I usually describe the kubelet, it's almost like an agent that's running on all these machines and the agent is making sure that the containers run and, and, and understands how to run them and everything else. There's also a little proxy on all these worker nodes. The proxy is just helping the communication because I don't wanna think of this as four machines. I wanna think of this as a cluster, right? A cluster. Okay, so over here in my demo I'm doing over here in Google Cloud, um, my cluster is still building. Now. In Google Cloud, if I actually go over and look at what Google calls Compute Engine, this is Google's virtual machine technology, I'll see that the way Google is building this is it's actually constructing it on 
virtual machines, right? Those are KVM virtual machines in Google Cloud. But I didn't install the operating system, Google did. I didn't install Kubernetes, Google did, right? My master node isn't there because in Google Cloud, it's off screen. If you did this in AWS or Azure, you would see your master node as well, right? Google, that's, that's just a, a, a Google kind of thing they do. Okay, so my cluster is building. Ah, there we go. So my cluster is built. So do you see what it says? Hey, in your cluster, you've got 12 CPUs and 48 gigs of RAM in your cluster. Yes, that's true, but remember why. When I built that in my demo, I said each of those machines is gonna have four CPUs. Each of those machines is gonna have 16 gigs of RAM, right? So when you're constructing a cluster, yes, you have a certain amount of compute power in the cluster, but I couldn't run a container that used 12 CPUs, right? My biggest machine's got four total CPUs. So if I'm running a container, I gotta make sure I have a container that can fit along with everything else on one of those nodes, right? One of those worker nodes. Anyway, so I got an open source container orchestration platform here. And if you're doing Google or Alibaba or AWS, you know, it's still open source. It's still open source. It's just they're setting the environment up for you, right? I chose the version of Kubernetes I want to install. You know, those are just, Google's going to upgrade the version of Kubernetes for me over time. But again, that's that's infrastructure management the cloud's helping me with. Do this on-prem, right? Now, the next little thing I got to get is, you know, I talked about, okay, in my demo, you know, here's my container image down here. Container D knows how to run that container image. Um, I didn't mention it, but when I was building my cluster over here and I was talking about the machines in my cluster, one of the decisions I can make on my machines in my cluster is what operating system is running on those machines in that cluster. Currently in Google, they run a Google operating system based on Chromium called COS, Container Optimized Operating System, and they have Docker installed because currently the you know versions like, uh, what is this? This is like Kubernetes 118 or something. Currently Kubernetes, it basically goes Kubernetes to Docker to your container, right? But later this year, when they emit the Docker shim, then what you do is you might set up an environment where you don't really need the entire Docker runtime, if you will. You really just need to have something that can run container D, right? <coughs> so Kubernetes is coming through this way. You know, my demo is like this. I'm in Google Cloud, but it's really just a standard version of Kubernetes that's sort of running down. Okay, now, what Kubernetes then needed to do, if these, if my little purple boxes here are all Docker containers, right? If those are all Docker containers, then I gotta basically take that Docker container and put it in something that makes sense to Kubernetes. So Kubernetes comes along with something called a pod. Okay. And again, this, these links are all in my links file. But if you go to my links file, there's a, you can go read on the Kubernetes. This is a link to the Google website. Um, some of my links are to Google, but again, most of the, even the Google links, they're all standard Kubernetes. A pod is just, I don't, I don't know what you want to think of it as. On one hand, it's a unit of deployment. Whoa, that's really good. Um, a second here. Uh, let me make that a little smaller. Yeah. A pod, you could think of it as a unit of deployment. It wraps, you know, one to many containers, usually one. Okay. And it's, it's basically a runtime environment, right? A runtime environment. Or if you want to think of it as almost as like a mini VM, you know, where your, uh, where your pod, where your container runs, you know, th those would all be apt descriptions for a pod. Here's my container. Okay. So just a second ago, I was doing a demo over here. Um, just a second ago, I was doing a demo and I took my lightweight JavaScript application. I described a Docker container. I ran it and it pushed that Docker container up into a Docker registry in Google Cloud. And now the next step is I'd want to take it and deploy it into Kubernetes, right? Well, if that's my little, you know, Node.js container, what a pod does is it wraps it up and it gives it an IP address. So this pod would have like an, I, an IP address, okay? So it has a network interface on that pod. 
Um, the pod can give me access to things like storage. If you're used to Docker, Docker does a lot of the same stuff, right? But again, Kubernetes does it a slightly different way. It strips off that kind of Docker layer. It goes to that container image and it, it layers it with this pod concept. So a pod will have its own fixed IP address. Um, a pod will have access to storage. If I had two really tightly bound containers, then you know, if they wanted to talk to each other, they could talk to each other over a local host, you know, like they were running on the same machine, that kind of thing. So a pod is just the way Kubernetes wraps up my containers to make them play inside this Kubernetes world, essentially. Again, of course, they have to all have all their own technology, right? Now, what I need kind of next, if the pod wraps it, that's good, but then I kind of need a pod manager, if you will a pod manager. Sometimes people call these controllers. That's a classic name, controllers. Sometimes they'll call them workload managers. You know, there's a couple of different terms for this, but essentially they're pod managers. In standard Kubernetes, there's four main pod managers, okay? The most popular by far would be deployment. A deployment is where you basically wanna have a group of stateless pods. Okay. I'm building my web example here. And in my web example, you know, I got this lightweight web application. If I got three copies of it running, I don't care which one you go to because all three copies are going to do the exact same thing. Again, if you're in the Kubernetes container world, then you're probably taking a step into the microservice world. And if you're in the microservice world, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever read this uh, 12 factor app methodology kind of thing. Uh, but you see a lot of 12 factor methodology in um, container based systems, right? This is kind of like 12 guiding factors if you're building microservices, right? And if you read through them, you know, run it as one or more stateless processes and you access them through a URL and they all come from one code base, you know. So they, they've got some recommendations here. So if you're kind of in that microservice world, a lot of times you're doing deployments. A deployment might look like that, where what I do is I create a deployment. That's going to be a YAML file. I create a deployment. I'll go in here to kubectl. I'll go in here to kubectl and I'll say, uh, hey, let's, hey, hey, cluster, I want you to create a deployment for me. And what that API server will do is it'll load that configuration into etcd. That's where the config gets stored. And the scheduler wakes up and says, oh, you got a deployment for me. The deployment, this example deployment says there's gonna be three copies of this pod. And so it'll ex do exactly that, right? That's the kind of thing a deployment does. It works with the scheduler to get those three copies in. You see the controller manager? You remember I told you a lot of times people call these controllers. The controller manager is also saying, hey, how you doing there, deployment? You know, do you have what you need? Oh yeah, I, need, I got three copies, I, I, everything's happy. If one of these copies blew up and became unhealthy, you know, it'd be the controller manager, you know, and the cluster would say, oh, one of your copies blew up. Hey, scheduler, we need to schedule a replacement, pop a replacement in there, you know, so your workload managers sort of work with that controller manager to make sure the cluster has what you need. The second most popular type of workload manager, pod manager, would be what's called a stateful set. Well, if a deployment's a group of stateless pods, a stateful set would be stateful pods. And I say one to many. For example, if I were going to throw MySQL, uh, if I were going to throw MySQL in here, I I'm probably not going to have multiple copies of MySQL running, but MySQL would absolutely be a stateful instance, right? MySQL pod, you know, I'd pop a MySQL pod in here and that MySQL pod would need to be able to have like its own hard drive out here. And how would I make sure I got a MySQL pod and make sure there was one of them and it was always running and it always had a hard drive? Staple set, right? That's staple sets. Usually those are what you see. Daemon sets, that's mostly backend services. If I want to have like one pod per node because it's doing some backend service, that's a daemon set. The newest thing on this list is jobs. And I think cron jobs, if they're out of beta, not long. Jobs and cron jobs. These are more task-oriented pod. A new message just came into the queue. Wake up a pod, process the message, and then kill the pod. 
uh, that's job. And if I want to do the same thing, except instead of message in the queue, it's do the same thing every three hours, that would be cron job, right? So those are kind of the newest on this list. You don't see them that frequently. Okay. So I want to build a deployment like my picture right there. I want to have three copies of my little hello world JavaScript web application running here. Okay. I hope you like YAML. YAML stands for YAML ain't markup language, in case you were wondering. YAML is actually a superset of JSON, right? Uh, so JSON files are technically YAML files. Could I write JSON files if I wanted to? Yeah, but don't. Every example you will ever see in Kubernetes always uses YAML files. YAML had to be invented by a Python programmer, right? Because it's very positional. So like here, you can't really tell it, but that's actually two spaces right there. So, you know, I have a metadata block here and then I have two spaces over my name. Okay, so essentially, you know, what am I describing? You know, what is this YAML about here? I'm describing a deployment, that deployment right there. Okay, what do you want its name to be? Metadata, information about the deployment, right? Its name is gonna be Hello World Demo, okay? Specification, okay, what's in this thing? What's in this deployment, okay? Well, since it's a deployment, it's multiple pods. So I want three pods is what I want. I want three pods is what I want, okay? I'm gonna ignore that selector for a second. And then my template starts here and ends on the next page, right? So my template says, here's a template where I'm gonna tell you about what's gonna go in these three pods, okay? First off, everything I'm about to tell you is gonna have a label on it. A label is a post-it note. Labels, when I came to Kubernetes, I'm like, I don't get this label thing. It's arbitrary identifiers. If I took a post-it note off my pad here and I peeled it off and I stuck a sticker to each of my three pods that read app equals hello world demo, that's what that label is, okay? Kubernetes uses labels a lot to help find things. In this case, I got three pods, but what are their names? The way the way Kubernetes does this, since these are three stateless pods, they're all gonna be named like, hello world demo, blah. And I'm not gonna know the blah, cause it's gonna be random, okay? But how would I ever find those three pods again? This is how. I'm gonna know that my three pods all have a post-it note on them named app hello world demo. So I can find them with other things in Kubernetes, all right? So see the template here? This match labels, anytime you see a selector, it says, go find the thing with the label, so I'm gonna say three pods that have a template that match this. Okay, so that actually points down here. In theory, this template could be like off in another file. I could have a big template file with a bunch of templates to find, and this match label right here would say, go into that template file and go find the one with the post-it note on it, app hello world demo, okay? And this template and every pod created from it is gonna, every container or pod created from it is gonna have a post-it note, hello world demo. Let me continue. So what else is in these three pods, okay? Each of these three pods has a container. Dash in YAML means array, okay? So I only have one dash here because there's only one container. So this is basically the one container inside of my pod, right? Now my container is gonna have an image where it's gonna actually pull that image from. If I go back to my example, here's that actual file that I'm showing you right now, okay? And I built my Docker image and I put it in the Google container registry. So what I can do in here is I can say, yep, yeah, that image right now, you can find it over in the Google container registry. Um, that is actually, I'm using like a random test project. That's a, that's a test project name. So go to the Google container registry in this project. And if you have the permissions, you can go into the hello world demo folder and you can find the image with the tag or label 1.0. And that's what that really means, right? So where is the image? Where is the image? And then I have a bunch of options. This image is gonna be listening on the port 8080. That's gonna be a, uh, uh, this, this tells Kubernetes to expose it on port 8080, right? If I go back to this slide here, remember I said every single one of my pods has an IP address and every one of those IP addresses can at, listen on a port. So I just told Kubernetes, hey, all these pods in here, they're all gonna be listening to colon 8080, colon 8080, colon 8080, right? That's what I'm, 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 telling, I'm telling Kubernetes what I'm listening on. Then I handed in an environmental variable port. Yeah, my code, if you look at my code, 
I have it looking for an environmental variable named port to tell it where to listen. Okay. So in my code, I'm actually looking for that environmental variable right there. Then a lot of people don't do this, but you should always do this. You should specify your requested resources, right? So this is resources. Resources. Okay. Um, a thousand millicores equals one CPU. So what I'm saying here is when this runs, give it a tenth of a CPU and 128 megs of RAM while it's running. Um, if it blows past that, you can give it up to 200 uh, millicores, so a fifth, uh, a, a fifth of a CPU. You can give it twice as much CPU, twice as much memory. If it blows through that, it's going to blow up. Okay. If it blows through that, it's going to blow up. Uh, I was doing some testing just the other day. I think I still have this in my editor. I was doing some testing the other day, looking at a job running in Kubernetes in Google Cloud. And I was ending up with this. Okay. This is the memory usage of one of my pods running. And you see, Using more and more memory, more and more memory, more and more memory. Blue line is my request. Orange line is my limit. Okay. So just like I'm showing you here uh, or here. Okay. So the blue line was my memory request, 128 megs. The uh, orange line was 256. And you see what was happening. I was using more and more and more and more and more and more. Boom. The pod blew up. Kubernetes crashed that pod, threw it away, replaced it with a new one. I had it under load test. Okay, maybe it doesn't have enough memory. So do you see, I bumped up my memory limits. Nah, it was a memory leak. <laughs> it just ate up all the memory. But the nice thing about this limit here is Kubernetes won't let you have more than that. So if you're running into this cluster with a bunch of other pods, you can't like suck down all the resources on the cluster when you're running. So when I'm building my deployment, um, staple set, Syntax is very similar. When I'm building my deployment, I'm saying, yep, yeah, here we go, hello world deployment. It's going to be three copies of my hello world demo right there. Every single one of them is listening on port 8080. It's got an environmental variable that tells it it's listening on port 8080. And here's how much CPU and memory I want you to give it to start. And don't let it have more than that. If it tries to take more than that, shut it down. Okay. This resource stuff is also very important because when the scheduler says, where can I run this pod? One of the first things the scheduler does, is it says, tell me how much resources you need. Because I got some machines that have four CPUs and I got some machines that have 64 CPUs and here's all this junk running out there right now. Oh, I see. You need somewhere between a, a tenth and a fifth of a CPU. Let me find you space where you can run. All right. Now, to get this YAML file into my cluster, there's a command line utility. I'm going to pronounce it kubectl. I actually have someone sent me. I was joking about not knowing how to pronounce this kube control. Somebody sent me this uh, joke. They said, uh, "How do we know if they're dead or just pretending?" It's pronounced kubectl. No, it's kubectl. No, it's kube control. Yeah. Ugh. Okay. Yeah. No one really agrees on what this is. I used to always call it kube control, but I'm, if you haven't already noticed, I'm spelling challenged. And so I kept typing K-U-B-E-C-T-R-L. And I actually heard this talk and this guy called it kube cuddle. And my first thought was, that's a stupid name, but like stuck in my head, right? So kube cuddle is a command line tool. And like I said, kube cuddle talks to that REST service right there. So you got to set up a configuration file for kubectl before you ever use it. I didn't mention that in here. In Google Cloud, there's an easy way I can do that. I can say, hey, cluster, I want to connect to you. And it'll say, you want to connect to this cluster, run this command right here. And if you have permissions, wherever you run that command, it will configure access to that particular cluster. If I go into my little virtual machine here and I say, uh, show me all the files on this machine. Show me all the files in my drive up here and uh, show me the hidden files too. Show me, uh, show me the hidden files. There's actually a file that builds out here called, everyone calls the kube config file. 
and the kube config file has all the information on getting into that cluster. What's the self-signed SSL certificate to get into it? What's its IP address? What's its name, right? So all the information to get there, and it hasn't loaded it yet, but if I come back here a little later on, I'm gonna see the, I'll actually have a key file that gets loaded in here that actually has my access credential to get it. Okay. So once I have done that, kubectl will work. And if I say like kubectl, uh, cluster info, it'll say, oh yeah, I see that cluster. I see that cluster, that's that IP address I, I just showed you right there. Yeah, I see that cluster, it's right over there. All right. And if I wanna deploy something, these are the two most common kubectl commands you'll ever do. Hey, kubectl, apply everything you find in that file named whatever, All right? So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna say, well, in my folder is my Kubernetes app YAML file. That's the one I was just showing you guys a second ago. I, let me make sure. I did paste in my path to my image, didn't I? Yeah, so I pasted in the path to my image. Okay, now in my YAML file, I actually have a second section, see dash, 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 and, I, and another thing, okay? I also want you to create a service. I haven't talked about that yet, okay? But I will in a second. So I got really have two distinct things in this file. Do you have one big file with lots of things in it, or do you have multiple files in like a folder? Kubectl can do a whole folder too. If I say apply dash F and I give it a path to a folder, it'll just boom, 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 go through all the YAML files, right? Okay, so yeah, kubectl. Yeah, kubectl, um, I want you to apply everything in my file name Kubernetes app YAML. And they'll say, I see a deployment, I see a service, they're both created in the cluster. And they'll throw that into that cluster. Um, hey, kubectl, could you show me the pods? Get pod. Get is like a list command. Hey, kubectl, show me the pods. Ah, you see there's three pods, but you see container creating. Uh -huh. So it's created three pods, and, but they're not actually running yet. Right. Uh -huh. One of them's up and running now. It's got to pull the image down and cache it on the machine. Also, it's probably running it on multiple machines. It tries not to run the same ones on the same machines. So the first time you run especially, it takes a moment to get up and run it. There we go. My three pods are running. Notice the ugly, nasty names I talked about. They all start kube, hello world demo, and then they have some random thing after that. Hey, describe some pod. Okay. Hey, kube cuddle, instead of get pod, could you describe a pod for me? Oh yeah, and by the way, the pod name is that right there. Could you describe that pod for me? And it's like details, show me the details. You see like the memory and everything, all those requests are in there. Any labels will be there. You see it tells me what image it's running. It'll tell me what containers it has. Does it have any hard drives? Uh, anything like that, right? Okay. So, logs, I can dump out logs if I wanted. Um, uh, what happens to the request which is sent to the pod blown up? Uh, okay, hang on a second and let me talk about that a little bit more. Yep, show me the logs in that pod. You can actually like, you see this command right here is really kind of handy. Ah, I'm, that's a typo, that shouldn't be there. I edited that line and I didn't do it correctly. If you do a kubectl exec dash it, that, that's redirect like standard IO and TTY or something to this particular pod, what that'll actually do is open up an SSH session to a pod, which is kind of cool. So if you're like testing a pod, that's, you, you can SSH into the container and test the container. If you have multiple containers, go to the second one and you can get multiple containers. Anyway, so some basic kubectl commands, the kubectl cheat sheet, again, in my links file, you know, uh, in my links file, in my Kubernetes section, yeah, I got a link to, in my general Kubernetes section, I got a couple of links to kubectl cheat sheets, right? I also noticed right below that, have links to deployments and stateful sets. And I just talked about pod rest specifications. I got some links to pod specifications. So I got a bunch of links in there. Anyway, the last major piece of my story I got to talk about is when you build a microservice application, it's not just one pod you're deploying. You really are going to have a bunch of pods. Again, if you look at my, somewhere in here. Uh,
Uh, yeah. If you look down in my like tools and dev section, I actually have a link to a, a microservice demo from Google. It's much fancier than my demo. Okay. So if you want the microservice demo, it looks like that. So it's a storefront. Okay. It's a storefront. If you go to it, it's, it's a whole working storefront. And I, you can deploy it into your cluster and it, and it looks like that, right? It's a working storefront. Looks like that. And they have like 11 different containers written in different languages and everything else. But when you deploy it, it looks like that. So I've got requests coming in from the outside world that need to find the front end pod because the front end pod can build web pages. But when the front end pod can build web pages, it needs to be able to find a product catalog pod because a product catalog pod knows how to give you a list of product catalogs with recommendations. And of course, it's a Google example, so there's advertising. And then I have my checkout service, and it needs the email service. So if you really go on the microservice path, you're not just gonna have one pod, you're gonna have multiple pods. And I'm not just gonna have one copy of front end, I'm gonna have multiple copies of it. Just like in my example, Google's got a lot of nice visualization in here. And if I go look at my workloads, you know, it'll tell me, yeah, I got a hello world demo. It's a deployment. It's got three pods running. And again, you know, uh, I got these three pods out here running. There's those three individual pods. And if I drill into one of those pods, I can see the container and everything else. So I got those multiple pods running. They're running on different machines, right? So they each have their own IP address, but how do I expose that to the internet? I don't want to have three IP addresses, right? That's not going to really work. I really need, you know, like, I really need a load balancer right there. Really need like a load balancer right there. And I need to be able to send the request to the load balancer. And I need to have multiple copies of this and that and the other, because I don't want to have single points of failure. Yeah. So when you look at your cluster networking, all your access from the internet, it's coming through the node interface, right? Because that's actually the VM. But like what Google Cloud does is they have two they have two levels of IP addresses. They got a level of IP addresses that are your node IP addresses. And then all your pods are like coming from a whole nother IP address range. If I go look at my cluster, you know, I can see it'll tell me, yeah, um, all your pods are gonna be in this IP address range. Well, okay, two problems. That's a private IP address, so I can't route traffic from the outside world. But also that's DHCP, right? So I can't reliably depend on the IP address for a pod. Do something like auto scaling. I don't just have three pods. Sometimes in the day I have two pods. Sometimes I have 30 based on load. You know, you can't depend on the IP address of a pod, right? So enter another Kubernetes concept called a service. A service provides a stable network representation for a group of pods. All a service does is a request comes into the service. It turns around and says, meeny, meeny, money, mo, where should this request go? And it sends it to one of the pods. You know, it's random selection on a pod. There's two types of services, a cluster IP and a load balancer that you typically see. There are other types out there that I'm not addressing. A cluster IP would be in the cluster traffic, right? So if I'm talking like, how does a front end pod find a checkout pod? Well, really what the way it would do that is the front end pod would go to, go to the checkout service. The checkout service would actually have, you know, one to many pods behind it. And the nice things about services, when I say a stable network representation, what I mean is they have a fixed IP address, a fixed VIP, a fixed virtual IP. And also within the cluster, they have a fixed name. Clusters have uh, DNS servers. So like the way, the way a front end pod would call, find a checkout pod is it wouldn't know the IP address. It would just look it up by name. It would go looking at the local DNS server, go find the thing named checkout service, and that traffic will get routed. Because your cluster, I didn't show it in my cluster diagram, but there's a little DNS service in there for the cluster. For the outside world, that's where you tend to see load balancer services. Load balancer services only work because there's some external load balancer that's routed to them. Okay. So this requires outside the cluster support. So in Google Cloud, what it would look like is Google has something called a TCP regional load balancer. That's a Google Cloud construct. When I come in through my kube cuddle and I say, here's a service, what my cluster does is it fixes up all the service information. It's almost like an IP, ad, an IP table running on every node. 
Okay. But it also, besides, you know, setting that up on all the nodes, it also went out through that cloud manager and said, Hey, Google, build me a load balancer. And it will have a fixed IP address, right? It'll have a fixed IP address. There's an example of a service. What is it? It's a service. The service type in this example is a load balancer. How does it find pods? You remember my selector label thing? Go find every pod that's got a post-it note on it, app equals hello world demo. Well, that's lucky. Because all my pods right here, they all have post-it notes on them, app hello world demo. So that's what it's going to look like in Google Cloud is really this is going to have one IP address up here. You know, I'm going to have an IP address right here. It's going to go to a load balancer. The load balancer, see my red line? The load balancer is going to route a request to one of the nodes. It's going to hit that node. On that node, there's basically the service waiting. The service is going to say, oh, you want a, uh, you want a pod that's got uh, the app Hello World demo? There's three of them. Let me write you a one. Okay. And the job of the service is also to stay up to date on things. So one of the questions went by would be, what happens if you write a request to one of the pods that's blown up? Um, if the cluster notices that a pod is blown up, one of the steps it'll go through is it'll take that service and it'll say, okay, update your list of IP addresses. So as your pods come and go, the service is usually your most up-to-date information on where are all those pods. Okay? Now, before the cluster notices, is it possible that I get an error coming into a pod that blew up and it hadn't been replaced yet and the service doesn't realize it yet? It's possible. But what I didn't show you in my demo is I could also set up they call them readiness tests and liveliness tests. They're health checks. So I can set up health checks to run in the background. And look, every two seconds, I want you to make sure all my pods are there. You know, I, I could configure that, but I didn't. So I deployed that service right there to Google Cloud already. Because when I ran my command here in my file, not only did I have my deployment, but I also had my service. So the way Google Cloud reacted, like I said, Google Cloud ran over here into my network services. It built a load balancer with a really lovely name. Okay. And you see this load balancer says it has a target pool of three instances. That's the three VMs. Okay. So I'm looking at that load balancer right there. It sees the three VMs. So when I send a request to its IP address, oh, by the way, if I click on it, it'll tell me its IP address is that right there. Okay. So, you know, if I go to that IP address, hello world, right? If you want, you can go to that IP address and, you know, hello world. So what it really did is that request, Sorry. that request hit my load balancer right there. It routed down to one of the machines, that branch right there. When it hit the machine, kind of the second half of that load balancer service is waiting and it's really an IP address table. What are you looking for? Oh, you want that hello world pod, uh, go to that one, right? And every time it every time it hits a request, it sends you to one of those pods. All right, so that's what it looked like in the load balancer. If I go back into Kubernetes, you know, again, uh, I can ask my cluster, hey cluster, show me my workloads. There's one workload, hello world demo with three pods. I can also ask it to show me my services and it'll show me my service right there. If I'm doing it the classic way, I can also say, you know, hey, kubectl, get me a list of pods. There's your three pods running. Okay. Hey, kubectl, get me a list of services. You got two services running. One is like a behind the scenes Kubernetes cluster IP service, nothing to do with me. Okay. The one facing the outside world, there's that load balancer, and there is its IP address. That's the same one I just sent you guys a second ago that you're going to. All right. This actually says when it bounces from the load balancer into the one of the nodes, take it into the node on port three two six five eight, and that's where the service will be waiting. So that that's where the load balancer goes to a node. It actually comes in on that port, and that's where that service is going to be waiting in the cluster that says, "Oh, you want a hello world pod? Here you go," and it'll send it to you. Okay. So I got my cluster built. I deployed one deployment that's managing three pods. Um, oh, sorry. I've got one service that is managing three pods, right? And the three pods are all in this one workload I have, Hello World Demo, there's my three pods. 
And again, you know, I can drill in. You see, this is where I was getting those charts that I was showing you a minute ago. I can see CPU and memory. This is where running in an environment like a cloud provider, Google, AWS, Azure, Alibaba, you know, they, they try to give you bells and whistles to make this easy. And visualization and um, Google also builds me like a, a dashboard down here and I can go to my dashboard and, you know, again, this is, this is when you're hosting somewhere like Google, you know, they're giving you this stuff. Yeah. you got one cluster, you know, here's your, your load CPU and memory across your cluster. And, you know, here's the nodes and what's happening on the nodes, you know, here's the workloads that are deployed. I don't see mine. Yeah. Those are all back in workloads, right? Let me get a full list of workloads and where, oh, there's my hello demo workload. 0% of 0.3 CPU, okay? Each of my pods asked for 0.1. So the total workload asked for 0.3, right? Well, tell me more, you know, I can come in here and get all kinds of metrics on it, on what it's doing. This is all my different pods running. Yeah, you know, so there's a lot of good features you can get out of your provider, but you don't need all this, right? I could, there's command line ways I can get metrics. There's command line ways I can get log files, right? Um, if I go over here and I go back to Kubernetes for a second, you know, if I go to Kubernetes and I go to that workload, if I go to that workload, I can also like look at the log files coming out of it, okay? Look at the log files coming out, maybe. Uh -huh. Hello world, received request. Hello world, received request, right? Remember what my code's doing. My code is just dumping messages out to standard out, right? In my code, every time you visit my homepage here, it dumps a message to standard out. Another very 12 factor kind of thing is you tend to have your containers dumping the standard out and then the cluster just picks all that up, okay? And that's all that's happening. The cluster's picking that up and in Google Cloud, ooh, it's showing me that nice thing. Yeah, but I could also say, hey, kubectl, if you get the logs for every pod with the label app equals, every pod with the label app equals, what was my label? I forget. Uh, yeah, hello world demo. Could you get all the logs for every pod that has that label app equals hello world demo? There you go. Okay, you see it's all the same. This is my container starting, right? And then you see receive the request, receive the request, receive the request. Yeah. So open source. Run it lots of places. It helps you run containers at scale. There's a Kubernetes cluster in the back of every target store in the country. That's about 8,000 clusters. They run Kubernetes in every store. They use something called OpenShift from Red Hat to help manage all those clusters. Yeah, okay, lots of clusters. Banking clusters, there's a ton of examples of companies that, that have moved their workloads into, you know, Kubernetes. I just taught a Kubernetes class for Humana Healthcare. You know, they're gonna be running healthcare apps out of, out of Kubernetes. So lots of companies are doing this exact thing. And again, most of the classes I do are all for Google. So they're going to be running this cluster in Google because the cloud's going to help them out, right? But run it in your data center. I just attended a workshop on running Kubernetes and VMware. You know, that's a nice thing. It's open source. It's very cloud and environment agnostic. Okay. Pick your cloud or your provider that you want to go with and you can go there or you want to build it yourself, build it yourself. And like I said, if you go to my links file, I got a bazillion files. Even though my links file was originally designed you know, to be, you know, this is just a place when I teach, every time I find a cool link for Google Cloud, I put it in here, but you'll see I have a very big Kubernetes Istio related section. And most of it is just general purpose Kubernetes. All right, good, good, good. Um, excellent. Ah, now Terry says, what if the request blew up the node? Now it's no longer a Kubernetes problem. Kubernetes can do, for example, auto scaling and health repairing pods within the cluster. But Kubernetes is just managing the cluster itself. If you have a, a whole node go down, a virtual machine go down, or what if you want to add more nodes to your cluster? Or what if you wanted to actually auto scale the entire cluster? Because you know how the cloud works? It's pay for what you use per second for the most part. So if I check the price of this cluster in Google Cloud, Google's going to build me 
10 cents an hour management fee. That's like a flat rate okay, for every cluster, no matter how big. But mostly what I'm paying for in this example is I got three, you know, four, six, four CPU, 16 gigs machines, each with a hundred gig hard drive. That's the majority of my bill if I'm in Google Cloud, right? So what if I wanted to auto scale? So based on load, sometimes I want to have more servers, sometimes I want to have less servers. None of that is handled by Kubernetes. This is where your infrastructure comes in. If we're talking VMware, VMware can do auto scaling and node repair and all that. If I'm in Google Cloud, these are all features I can turn on. Yeah, hey, you know, Kubernetes, yeah, I got my one cluster here. Right now my cluster has three nodes in it. If I go to this node pool, which is a group of nodes, okay, another Google thing, I can edit that node pool and I can say, yeah, but it has three right now, but let's bump it up to five. Or you see auto scaling. Okay, let's have a minimum of two nodes and a maximum of 300 nodes based on CPU load. Okay, and it will auto scale that for me. But again, that is no longer a Kubernetes problem. That is now a benefit of running it in a hosted environment like Google Cloud. Good. Other questions? Health checks fall under that. If Google notices that one of my servers is non responsive, it'll spin up a a new server and drop it into the cluster and drop that cluster out, that, that server out. Meanwhile, Kubernetes is going, wait a minute, some of the containers are missing, what's happening? Reschedule, right? Kubernetes is pretty resilient by itself. And if you combine it with something that's helping you make your infrastructure more resilient, yeah, it's a nice combination. Good, other questions? All right, guys, let me do this then. Uh, I got a quick question. Yeah, shoot. Um, it's around um, the, what's what's uh, best practice for setting up uh, or for using Kubernetes in a CI CD pipeline. Like, um, for example, if I wanted to just um, set up um, a repository so that when I push it to the repository, it'll build. Um, but Kubernetes will be a part of that build process. It, it, it's really easy, right? Because um, what you're really saying is, you know, on one end, I've got my Git repo that my developers are, you know, pushing code into. And all I really need something that can be a build tool, right? So it's going to push an image into the registry. And then I need something that can say, oh, a new image just showed up in the registry and can push it from there to, you know, your uh, Kubernetes cluster. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to do something like that, again, this step from the code to the registry, you could use something like Jenkins, all right? That would work really well there for there. If you're drinking the Google Kool-Aid, you might go cloud build or something like that. To go from the registry to Kubernetes, again, you could use something like Jenkins. Or if you want some a tool that's really more built for that, you might check out like Spinnaker. Spinnaker was invented by uh, Netflix. Netflix, I think it's Netflix, and uh, that they use it to go from the registry to Kubernetes. They use Spinnaker for that, but Jenkins can do the whole thing. Uh, and there's a lot of other tools out there, right? Um, I don't know if you've ever seen. I think I got a link in my dev section. Uh, there's this website you can go to that has like just a huge list of dev tools, right? I don't see it. Okay, uh, and um, there's a lot of CI CD tools. Ah, there we go. I don't know if you've ever seen this. This is kind of fun. This is called the landscape of, you know, dev tools kind of thing. And in the landscape of dev tools, right up over here, you know, there's a lot of tools I could use for that. Nice thing is, since Kubernetes is getting so popular, pretty much any of these guys would work to do that, right? If I asked Google, they'd say cloud build for the first part, Spinnaker for the second. Okay, or cloud build for all of it. That's a Google solution. Jenkins is probably the most popular build tool in the world, you know, or Circle CI or something. Most of the tools, think about it. The way to get in the cluster is just a kubectl command. So that's really easy to do. I could also, Terraform can handle, you know, building your infrastructure, but Terraform also works with Kubernetes nowadays. So I could use something like Terraform to help. But yeah, building a CI CD pipeline, it's very easy to do. And like, if I come in here and look at my workload, Google's like, hey, would you like to set up an automated pipeline for this workload? 
because Google has like a Git repo in the cloud I can do. Google has a build tool in the cloud I can do. It's not very high tech, but I can like click a button and in a few steps have a basic CI CD pipeline set up. It's it's very easy to do. Good. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. Absolutely. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Going back to where you were scaling the actual virtual machines, how do you inform Kubernetes to allow it to open, like to, 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 to like bring up the number of pods? So I can only run so many pods on, say, one node. If I right. go into Google and I say, hey, increase my nodes to, uh, you know, more VMs, how does Kubernetes, how do, how do I scale Kubernetes so that it knows it can now use that to grow that's a great pods. question <laughs> that's a great question if you ever build a cluster on your own there's actually a step you go through where you you go back to your cluster and you know i, I talked about my control plane and there's, there's literally a message that you say to the control plane and you're like hey control plane meet this new kublet kub proxy over here on this node over here uh, on this new node over here and the control plane's like oh great nice to meet you you know, and there's a manual way you could do that if you were like doing this on your own. I built a cluster with three and I wanted to add a fourth, but it's like a virtual machine and VMware. There's literally a manual step you do for that. And if you're in a hosted provider like Google, they're just taking care of that for you, right? So when Google upscales, you'll see upscaling is gonna take a couple of minutes because part of that couple of minutes is it's gotta get the virtual machine up and running with all the right software in it. And once it stabilizes, it just runs a step that literally does that for you. Hey, hey, master node, meet your new worker node over here. You guys get together and work, right? You know, so th there is a step that normally you'd have to manually do. But if your cloud provider has auto scaling, and most of them do these days, they're just kind of taking care of scripting that all for you. Great, thanks. There's also ways in Kubernetes if you're downsizing, right? where you can basically say to the scheduler, hey, scheduler, uh, there's this node over here that's about to go away. Would you please move everything on to other nodes? And the scheduler says, got it. Stop putting stuff over there, move everything off. And you know, it'll literally do the thing where I got this pod running over here and it'll schedule it and put it over here. And once it's up there and running, it'll kill that pod off and update your service. So, you know, nothing, it, it, it can wait wait till all the connections drop or a max of X amount of time, you know? So there are some things you can say like that. If I'm gonna take a note away, there's a command I can tell Kubernetes, stop scheduling and clean off what's there with the max timeout of such and such. And, you know, so Kubernetes has some basic hooks to help you add and remove nodes. And all you have to do is you, you put some management technology on top. You know, maybe it's VMware or, you know, vSphere, ESXi stuff. Maybe it's something like Google Kubernetes engine, right? And that's, you know, that's like, you know, that's like the, the salesy part. You know, if you're, if you're talking to your cloud people, I kind of slide in here. At, at Google, there's a, a, a developer that works for Google and she goes by the cloud girl. I have a nice Kubernetes section, by the way. This, this YouTube video is really good on Kubernetes. Um, but yeah, the cloud girl, she has this sketch where she's like, you know, hey, you know, Containers are over on the left, and yeah, how do I host containers, Kubernetes? But I heard it's not that easy to install and manage on my own. Well, guess what? Google has a product. You know, all your cloud providers kind of have that, can tell you that same story. This is a very popular cloud product because of that. They help you manage the infrastructure. You know, what did it take two, three minutes for me to build a whole cluster? You know, I got a whole cluster. I can play with this cluster. I'm getting billed per second. But when I'm done with this demo, I can throw that whole cluster away and be done. You know, that, that kind of stuff's really easy to do in the cloud. And I did it through the user interface. I could have just as easily done it with command line or Terraform or whatever. Yeah, good. All right, now let me do this before I take any more questions. I'm gonna save my presentation. And I gave you guys the link to my presentation already. If you weren't here when I gave that out, if you want a copy of my presentation with my annotations in it, I got it in Dropbox. Oh, that's why. It's like, it won't let me right click. It still won't let me right click. Of course. Ah, there we go. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. Let me just scroll back. I, I sh shared it in the chat window. Uh, there it is. There we go. Chat history. Since I can't for some reason get the updated link, so right there, so link to my presentation. 
there's a Dropbox link to my presentation. And I believe uh, uh, this is going to go up on YouTube. And when it goes up on YouTube, you can you can find it there as well. Anyway, good deal. Anybody have any other questions or comments for me? All right, guys. Well, I appreciate you coming and spending a little time with us. Uh, in the presentation file, you also have my contact information. So you want to reach out and uh, ask questions or anything. Uh, let me go ahead if I can do it. Here we go. So if you want to reach out, touch base with me or find me on LinkedIn or something, please feel free. Other than that, I think that's it. Appreciate it, y'all. Have a good evening, rest of your evening, and uh, we're almost to the weekend, so enjoy that too. Thank you, Hector. Yeah, thank you. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Thank you. Good. Yeah, I'm going to um, see how let the post that video to the YouTube. I mean, that's going to be take a while, hopefully. Um, tonight I sent out the wrap up email to the, everybody. Uh, should have the, the email link. Yeah. All right. And also the link you posted here. Perfect. All right. Well, I appreciate it, everyone. Who knows? We'll All see right. you guys again. Bye.